Hi everyone, how's it going? My name is Helen McKenzie and I'm super excited to be speaking all of you to all of you at FOSS today. Um, my talk is called How to Get People Excited About Geo. So the reason I was speaking to you about this is my background is actually a very sort of traditional GIS background. I worked in GIS consulting for about 10 years. And then about a year and a half ago, I moved to a company called Carto, which you may have heard of. And my job at Carto is called Geospatial Advocate, which is all about getting people really excited about geospatial, really seeing the value of it, seeing why it's something that is so important to their businesses. But I think that even though that's something that is my whole job and something I've made a career out of, I think it's something that is actually so important to people across the geospatial industry. So that's what my talk is going to be about today, sharing some sort of tips and tricks I've learned along the way um, about geospatial advocacy and getting non-geospatial people really excited about geo. So I'm just gonna share my screen and run through some slides. Hopefully you can see my screen and let's head to the slides. So yes, as I mentioned, my talk is all about getting people excited about geospatial. So hopefully you'll take away uh, some lessons and food for thought from this talk. So just to quickly introduce myself. Um, so my, my background, like I said, is very traditional uh, GIS consulting, but really my sort of love of GIS has really grown in the last few years um, since I really started getting into the data visualization and data storytelling side of GIS. So one of my probably big biggest accomplishments uh, is this map to the top right, which is a drive time map to Nando's, which is if you're not from the UK, Nando's is sort of a cult level chicken shop in the UK. Um, and that was really something that kickstarted my love for uh, data visualization was doing this and seeing how people reacted to it and how much people enjoy making maps. But also I, I like to experiment with loads of different things. So for example, this map in the center here uh, shows the how the interest in banana bread around the globe changed throughout the COVID pandemic as everyone stayed at home baking. At the bottom here, we've got a map of every toilet in the world. So I really like sort of experimenting with data visualization and trying out different things. Um, if you are interested in what you see and want to sort of see more of some of the stuff I get up to, you can follow me at Helen Mix Maps on all of the sort of main social media platforms. So just to sort of kick off this session and talk about um, sort of frame what I'm going to be talking about. I want to start with this question, which is in a SaaS company, so a software as a service company, who promotes your products or services? So that might be your sales team. It might be your customer success team who are often working with existing customers. It might be product marketing, content marketing, social media team. Really, it's everyone in the company. But for people like Carto, that's actually really tricky, particularly for people in these sorts of disciplines. Because if you come from maybe a sales background or a marketing background, you don't necessarily know the sort of ins and outs of um, geospatial technology and the geospatial community and what sort of makes us tick, what are our aspirations and pain points. And that's really where people like me come in. So advocates, or you may also see us referred to as evangelists, which you see a lot more in the sort of very uh, tech cloud and developer world, uh, some people also refer to themselves as avocado, which I love. Um, but we're basically industry and subject matter experts. And we use products like Carto to illustrate the value. So we're actually using the product. I'll sometimes say I'm the person in Carto's marketing team who can use Carto. So we actually use the product to illustrate their value. So typically we know our ideal customers' pain points. We know their aspirations. We're familiar with industry trends, familiar with competitors, have a wide industry network and have a mixture of relevant technical and softer skills. So storytelling, for example, is really important, copywriting, presenting, all those things. So basically advocates are almost like live-in customers, people who would have been customers, who companies like Carto would have been trying to sell to, um, but we now work for Carto so we can use all of that expertise to help uh, help promote our products. So that's how we use advocates at Carto. But like I said at the start of this, I think advocates is so much, advocacy is something that is really important across our whole industry. And it's really important, not just if you're trying to sell a product or sell data or sell services, but it's something that is intrinsic to our sort of everyday life in geospatial. And I'll illustrate that in a second. So I just, when I was coming up with this talk, I was doing a bit of, bit of uh, soul searching, a bit of looking around the internet to see what other people were thinking about 
life in GIS because I've come across a lot of people in my career who absolutely love GIS and it's absolutely their passion but I've also come a lot come across a lot of people who really struggle with working in GIS and after a certain amount of time it can feel like a bit of a grind and I, I wanted to find some examples and to be honest it wasn't very hard finding examples so for example and it, that's also that can be people who've worked in GIS for a while but it can also be people sort of on the outside looking to get into a career in geospatial uh, so we have this example here is a career in GIS potentially really boring? Someone's wondering if they should go for a career in GIS because all they think they are doing is producing nice maps and stuff. Uh, this person has said that they feel like GIS is a bit of a limbo, seeing as though you're very, it's a very technical job, obviously. It's very, you have to have a lot of technical uh, data, maybe coding and visualization skills. But because a lot of other departments don't necessarily understand what you do, they maybe think you're someone who's working in IT, you're sort of floating around different departments, you're sort of can be looked down on as support and not necessarily valued in the way that you maybe should be. Uh, this one's a bit of a longer one. I won't read this whole one out. But this is someone who's working in uh, geospatial development, actually, and they're saying they feel the work they're doing is not being recognised should they look for a new job. So they're really struggling to get promotions, struggling to get pay rise, and they think it's because the company is just not really valuing the skills that they have. And this one, this is just the title, but I think it really sums up how a lot of people can feel. It's definitely how I felt at certain points in my career. Feeling undervalued as a GIS professional what other careers can this be pivoted to? So I think it's a real shame if lots of people are feeling this way, we could be potentially losing loads of really talented people from our industry if they're feeling undervalued and feeling like they're not, their contribution isn't being valued in the way that it should be. And then this one, actually, I saw this on LinkedIn a few weeks ago and it actually kicked off my whole idea for um, this presentation, which was someone saying, I've always found GIS a bit dull. How could they? I like maps as much as the next person. But what? But beyond being a nifty data visualization tool, I struggle to see the so what about GIS. And they're saying they want to learn more about what GIS actually is to go from just Daneful to Evangelist. I don't think I said that right. Um, but they're, they're basically calling out for more info about what GIS actually is. And I think this is true of a lot of people. I think a lot of people think GIS is basically just making maps. And not that there isn't a huge amount of value in that, but there is so much more to GIS and so much value in it. And I think people aren't necessarily getting that. So all of this comes down to what I think is a big problem in our industry, which is that does GIS have a marketing problem? Like, do, are we not communicating effectively what our industry is and the value of it? And maybe how can we change that? So in the next few slides, I'm just going to run through these sort of three key concepts. Why does GIS have a marketing problem? Why, why aren't people getting uh, the value of what we're doing? Why is that a problem? Why is that a problem for uh, us and for sort of the wider industries that we touch? And finally, how can we tackle this? So first of all, why does GIS have a marketing problem? So... I think one of the reasons we have a bit of a marketing problem is we're really hard to sort of place in a in an in, in a organization sorry really hard to sort of fit into an organogram so this is what i imagine an organogram of a uk local authority council might look like you might be able to tell that i have never worked for such a council but perhaps you have your sort of overseeing the people in charge the people who oversee everything that's happening then you have your key disciplines. So that might be transport planning, that might be housing, that might be potholes and bins, which we know are the two things that people are most concerned about in the UK. But then GIS sort of helps all of those different disciplines and it doesn't neatly fit into one. It's very cross-disciplinary. Cross I can never say that word. So if you were to draw an organogram, it might look something like this. GIS might fit across all of um, all of the disciplines. And in that way, it's kind of like a corporate function. So the same as uh, support and administration and IT and those sort of functions. And I think in that way, not that those aren't incredibly valuable functions as well, but I think that can mean that people stop thinking about GIS as being a discipline and so valuable. So in a way, I, I always think one of the best things about geospatial is how it is cross-disciplinary and how it brings these dis different disciplines together. But actually that can be to our own detriment as well, because we're not seen as potentially having the same values as some of these other disciplines and also means that we don't have that access to those uh, top dogs, those people overseeing things. 
And that can also have implications for career paths. So I've definitely really struggled in the past with getting promotions and getting pay rises because I was sort of sitting in an almost horizontal uh, discipline rather than a vertical discipline, if that makes sense in the scope of this very badly drawn organogram. Um, so that can also look different in different organizations. So for example, uh, here we have GIS as its own discipline. It's its own, um, it's sub sort of its own vertical within the company. Um, the problem with that is that that doesn't always necessarily work because like we said, GIS is cross-disciplinary and it has to always serve and support and drive forward all of these other disciplines. So that means you can end up having your, like I've worked in a lot of places where you have your sort of GIS team, and then you have GIS individuals working in these different teams and it just makes it feel more disparate and that can make it harder to communicate the value of as well. Um, I think also something that is becoming more and more apparent and I feel like it's talked about more and more in the GIS industry is how GIS as an industry is evolving and how it's fitting in more with maybe data science and data analytics they're becoming closer together they're not so separate as maybe they once were and I just want to share this really interesting graph that I uh, dug out from our um, sales database which shows the words that are featured in the job titles of our top ops so ops are basically organizations that we might be selling Carto to so what's really interesting and Carto is based a geospatial uh, company we sell software to do geospatial analysis with but you can see GIS doesn't actually feature as a job title until you get to the this is the top 20 job titles and it's the 19th so there's all these other things that come before it including data IT product engineer so I think that there's something there as well there's something around how um GIS and data maybe need to overlap more, how they're maybe becoming more similar, and it's maybe a bit of an identity struggle for us at the moment. Um, and then, but I, I really think the, the key thing, aside from all of those things, that the key thing that is making us have a bit of a marketing problem is we like GIS stuff and not everyone likes GIS stuff. So what I mean by that is the things that we love, uh, and this might, some of this might be you, this might not all be things that you love, but as a very broad strokes and to really stereotype our industry as much as possible. These are the things we love. We love our tech. We love our tools. So we love like our drones. We love our data. God, I love my data. And we love our maps. But not everyone does, as hard as that is to believe. So things other people love, uh, they love saving money. They love saving time. They love, well, they don't love risk. They love mitigating risk. <laughs> That's a very badly phrased sentence. And they love getting results. They love, um, yeah, delivering things for their clients, delivering things for the public. They like to deliver things that are good. And I think what we need to do more is translate the things on the left. So translate our tech tools, data and maps into the things on the right. We need to communicate them as the things on the right. And something we also need to do, I think, and this is less about sort of internal politics, but it's more about people first getting into geospatial, is um, we need to think about how people are first emphasizing, uh, first encountering geospatial. I um, really believe in this, and I'm not, I'm not sure if it's an un unpopular opinion or a hot take, but I think a lot of people first encounter geospatial um, and they just learn, spent ages learning about all the technology. I know that my first lecture in GIS, I learned all about GPS and coordinate systems. And I seem to have a lot more lectures all about coordinate systems. And I think it can put people off and it, it definitely put people off uh, in, in my experience. So I uh, did a geography degree for my undergrad and we all had to take GIS modules in our first year. There was about 300 of us, I think, in our whole course. Um, and of those 300 people, only two of us stayed to do a GIS master's at the end of those three years. And still, when I bump into people from my undergraduate and they ask me what I do for my job when I say I work in GIS, I have had people say to me, why? Why do you do that? Because I don't think people understand the power of GIS. and I don't think we're explaining it to people as powerfully as we could. I think we should be explaining geospatial as a problem solving tool, as something that is that has real world applications outside necessarily just academia, but to businesses and to local councils. And I think 
we need to think about the problems that we're talking about but also emphasizing that sort of the deliverables and the power of our analysis rather than spending ages talking about the foundations before you even get to that stuff and while I completely get that the foundations are really important and uh, really crucial to get those sort of act uh, accurate and precise insights I think like you need you need to explain the power at first you need to get people excited about what geospatial is before delving into three lectures about coordinate systems uh so that's kind of my ted talk on why i think we have a marketing problem and what what we're sort of what we could be improving on but i just want to quickly touch on why that's a problem what why is it a problem that we have a problem so the, the way I'd sort of describe it is maybe you need one of these things. Maybe you're working on a project and you need a budget extension. Maybe you need a timeline extension. So whoever's the project manager hasn't given you enough time to deliver your work. Maybe you need to hire more staff on your team. Or maybe you need a specialist. So maybe you need someone who's a geospatial developer and you only have analysts at the moment. Maybe you want to buy some new software or some new data. Or you want a promotion for yourself or a colleague or someone you mentor, similarly a pay rise. You want to do some training and go on a course. Or maybe you just, it, it's an emotional thing. You just want to feel more valued. I think all of us really want to feel valued at work. And I think being able to advocate for the value of geospatial makes doing all of these things so much easier. If you go in to your meeting with your project manager and they ask you, why do you need a budget extension? If you start talking about the data and the tech and the tools and getting really into the nitty gritty of it, they're just going to zone out. And I think being able to almost market why you need that budget extension and explain to it in the real terms, in the terms that we talked about just here, talk about risk, talk about eventually saving money and time, getting results, then that will be so much easier to get. So these are all the things that you know, I, my job is a geospatial advocate and these are things I want, but I think they're things that all people working in geospatial will face at some point or another and being able to advocate for yourself and for the brilliant work you do will just make this so much easier. So what can we do to fix this? What are the sort of practical things that we as geospatial professionals can do to get people excited about geospatial and see the value of it. So this is sort of my main point of my TED talk, which is sell why, not how. So I think like I've sort of alluded to earlier, loads of us get really, really into the nitty gritty details because we love data and we love tech and we love all those um, quite geeky things about geospatial. I know I really do, but the people we need to approve our budget extensions and our promotions and things like that, they don't necessarily care about all that. And I've seen loads of people go into conversations with their managers or clients, et cetera, and they've immediately sort of opened up slides and slides about why they need a license for this, like talking about what this license for different software offers and uh, what all the different sort of aspects of this data set are. And people don't necessarily care about that. They care about what they're going to get out of it. So rather than talking about the tech and the data and the tools and all that stuff. Talk about that with your colleagues. Don't talk about that with your managers. Talk about these things. Talk about the money that your company is going to be saving or making. If you don't know what that is, try using time as a proxy because one of the biggest costs to most organizations is going to be labor costs. So if you can't put a number on it, put a time on it. Use client feedback. So talk about when you've done something like this in the past. So say you want to develop a really cool application um, and you're trying to get budget to do that or get the skills to do that. Talk about when you've done something similar in the past and how great that's been for your company. Same with colleague feedback, particularly senior colleague feedback. If you've had people that have loved something that you've done in the past, use that. And then Oh, I think this is a great one. Compare what you're doing to competitors. So if you can find examples of, say you want to, let's go back to that application, you want to develop this really exciting application for a client, find somewhere where your competitors are doing something similar because the last thing people are going to want to do is get left behind. So let's look at a couple of examples about this. I think we're okay for time, maybe. Uh, so let's say that you are currently storing all of your data in geodatabases and you've decided you want to move your data from from those database, databases to a cloud data warehouse. 
So what shouldn't you talk about? Don't talk about what the cloud is and how it works. You can give a brief overview of really a couple of sentences about this is what the cloud is, but don't get into the nitty gritty. People just need to know a general overview of what it is you're asking for. You don't need to go into detail on what the migration process would look like. Like by all means, at some point in the discussion, you could talk about time needed and costs needed and skills needed, but you don't need to go into detail, at least at the start. What you should be focusing on is the cost benefits of moving. So how many hours of time will you save when you're on the cloud? How much processing time will you save? What can you put numbers on those to get people to say like, oh, I can actually really see the tangible benefits of this for my business. You could say, but all our competitors are on the cloud. If they're doing it, they're going to be saving that time and money. They can be putting that time and money somewhere else. We're not saving that. So we're getting left behind. Let's look at another example. So say you wanted to do a course on Spatial SQL. Don't focus on what is SQL. You can mention it's a coding language. It deals with uh, databases. Don't focus on what can you do with SQL because people don't necessarily, <laughs> like depending on who it is, they might not necessarily know what you do anyway. If you would say, oh yeah, I can I can still create a dot density map with SQL. Someone's gonna be like, what's a dot density map? And then you end up down this rabbit hole and you get so far from talking about value. You want to stick to talking about value. So you could focus on, for example, risk aversion. So if you're working with SQL, you can all work from a database. You can query those central data sets rather than creating copies. And that means you've got that single source of truth of data. So you're averting risk, averting risk saves money. So much of it always comes back to money. And then again, cost savings. So particularly if you're working on a cloud-based uh, SQL enabled database, then you're gonna be saving loads of money, but SQL off also often makes things faster. It means you can automate things. It means you can replicate things and that's going to be saving money. So those sort of words like automate and replicate are really, really good words to throw in that you don't necessarily need to go into. And here's how we would build that tool that would automate something. They just need to know automate. Uh, final example, I think, uh, is next day you're arguing for promotion for your really talented colleague. You think they deserve a bit more recognition. So don't focus on the fact that they can run network analysis better than anyone in the country. Um, unless, of course, it depends on who you're talking to. All of this is caveated with it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to uh, someone who's maybe come up through the ranks and they have a GIS background, they might be really impressed by this. But if it's someone who maybe, I don't know, has a transport planning background or a landscape architecture background, they're going to be like, what's network analyst analysis? They're, they're, they're not really going to care about this. You can talk about their their technical strengths broadly, but it's all about what those technical strengths deliver. So you should focus on how much a client absolutely loved the work that they produced, how happy it made them, how much it helped them hit their goals. Maybe they delivered the work under budget because they are so good at network analysis, they can do things so quickly. So it's again, saving your client money, it's saving you money. So yeah, the profit margins that their excellent performance uh, means that they enable. So how how can you how else can you do this more broadly so i think it's really important to democratize geospatial i think like we're all here because we absolutely love geospatial but not everyone knows what it is or knows that it's cool and i think we not necessarily uh, we're not super guilty of this compared to some other industries but i do think in the past we've sort of there's that line like spatial is special you know what i mean we sort of think that um and this is, has probably been true in the past, that you need a really sort of extensive GIS background and education to be working with GIS. You maybe need to have a lot of really specialist skills. And I've definitely worked at places where the GIS team has been criticized of sitting in an ivory tower and sort of thinking that they are special and only they can do this work. And I think particularly as technology develops and as that sort of spatial uh, data science and GIS worlds collide even more, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I, I really think that we should be opening up spatial analysis as much as possible. I think um, spatial analysis is something that everyone can get more so than almost any other kind of data visualization, more so than any other kind of analysis or statistics. If you put things on a map, people can understand it so much better. And I think that means it, it shouldn't just be the map that people are getting. People should be able to do that analysis themselves as well. So I think it's really important to not close the door behind us and open it up for other people to learn more about spatial because once people start to get it, 
I think so many people find it so interesting. Um, so I, I also think we should be creating opportunities for people to have a go at GIS in a controlled way. So that's a lot of what we do at Carto is develop lots of tool tools for our solution where our end users can basically dabble in a bit of geospatial. So you, who's the expert analyst, sort of set up your web map so that your end user can go in and play with some widgets and adjust some parameters and sort of do a bit of analysis themselves. And that really helps bring people along for the journey. And finally, do market what GIS can do. I think um, it's very easy for us to sit on our laurels and think like, well, GIS is amazing. It's the, so important. It's so interesting. Everyone must get that. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. I've seen some organizations do some amazing stuff um, where they run sort of GIS days and open houses and they get people to come in and really see what they're doing. And they do newsletters and they have social media accounts that are basically just for internal purposes to get people excited about what they do. And I think that's fantastic. Um, I also, one of my top tips uh, in advocacy is don't use jargon and again this is caveated with it depends who you're talking to but if you can get rid of jargon as much as possible then people will just understand what you're talking about so much more and it's not particularly tricky de-jargonifying things so for example if I were to be talking about geographically weighted regression I could say a tool for measuring the strength of relationships between variables and how they vary spatially and I always think with things like this it's really helpful to have examples. So to be able to say, so for example, you might use it to measure the relationship between collision, traffic collisions and population or traffic collisions and um, nightlife spots and see where they vary in different locations. Uh, so another example with tile sets, uh, you could say that it's a method for breaking down big chunks, big data into chunks to visualize it more quickly. Uh, get is odd, you could just say, it's hotspots because I think a lot of people can just understand what hotspots are. Um, and one of my favorite ways to do this is to ask ChatGPT for help, but also to put my copy, so the words I've written back into ChatGPT and say, would someone with no knowledge of GIS understand this? And it's quite quite a good sort of sounding board for those sorts of things. And then I also think something we should think about is reframing GIS, which I've touched on a few points throughout this. But I think if we sort of think back all the way to the start of my talk, when we were looking at those uh, Reddit and LinkedIn posts about people who weren't that enamored with GIS, lots of people were saying, isn't it just maps? Isn't, isn't it just maps? And while maps are really important and I will fight anyone who says that they aren't, I think if we can frame GIS as being not just maps, but being part of a wider data and analytics ecosystem, then that immediately opens up its value to a lot more people. I think we also need to make sure we're talking about it as a decision-making tool. You know, maps aren't just maps. Like e even if what you're producing at the end of it is a map, that map is being used for something. People aren't just looking at it and being like, oh, that's nice. They're looking at it and saying, oh, so I should open a store here or I need to route my bus through here. It's a decision-making tool. At Carto, we always say, we like it's about turning data into actionable insights is our little buzz phrase. And again, I think it's it shouldn't just be for people with GIS in their degree or job title. I think geospatial is, should be for more people. So... I think I've nearly talked for too long, but I'm just going to really quickly run through uh, one of the ways that I like to do this. So um, when I'm evangelizing geospatial to people who, particularly who are completely new to the idea of geospatial and aren't brought into the value of it at all, I like to do something where I compare solving a problem when you think of it, when you approach it spatially and when you don't approach it spatially. So one of the problems that I sometimes use as an example is let's say that we are analysts at a car car share club somewhere in Europe and we are tasked with finding out if we should expand our operations to London. So I'm going to try and tackle this problem spatially and non-spatially. So the, the way I'm going to do this, this is obviously very oversimplified and illustrative, but um, it's just, just to sort of yeah illustrate the concept of why geospatial is important. So the approach I'm going to take is to investigate levels of car ownership. So if we were looking at this without location intelligence, maybe we'd just create a bar graph, bar graph or something. And it, maybe that bar graph would just show the percentage of households with and without access to a car in London. So we can see that while a higher percentage of households do have a car, which is this green bar down here, over 1 million households up here 
don't have access to a car, which is a substantial market. That's nearly 1 million households who could potentially use our car club. So we would say, yeah, let's expand to London. If we're going to do this, uh, approach this problem in a spatial way, we might do it slightly differently. So here we've got a map which shows all of the pink areas are areas where more households don't have a car. And all of the green areas are areas where more households do have a car. So we can see we've got a really striking pattern here as anyone who is familiar with London or just cities in general would expect. In or in central London, many more households don't have access to a car. Outer London, many more households do have access to a car. We've got some sort of islands here like Croydon and uh, down in, I think this is Woolwich, like public transport hubs. Um, but generally that's quite a strong pattern. So here we can say the insights from this analysis. Yep, like I said, households without cars are more commonly found in central London, but you have islands of low car ownership um, around sort of suburban public transport hubs. And these are really strong patterns. So there's not too many outliers and there's quite a strong, really clear, um, clear distinction between the two areas here. So if we were going to um, make our decision based on this map, we would say, yeah, let's still expand to London. We've got a really big market here, but actually that market is really concentrated in central and inner London. So for the greatest ROI or return on investment and lowest risk, we should really limit our activities to just those areas rather than trying to serve all of London, because we're not gonna have many people taking up our car club in outer London compared to inner London. Um, so that would help us really basically save money and give us a greater chance of success in those areas. Um, so that that's sort of a an example I give of solving the same problem, but in two different ways and the different sort of outcomes that you get. If you look at things spatially, you are getting a lot more detail. You can make a much more detailed decision and that mitigates risk and that saves you money. Um, so that's just one of the ways that I try and communicate to people why spatial is important. So to conclude, um, I think sometimes life in geospatial can feel like a grind. I've definitely felt that way in the past. I know a lot of people have as well, because I think you feel like you're constantly fighting an uphill battle of trying to persuade people why geospatial is so valuable and they don't necessarily get it. And geospatial is not alone. A lot of other industries and specialisms are like this when they're very specialised and they're very technical. It's really natural to feel underappreciated and misunderstood because you're constantly having to have those conversations about why it's so valuable. But I think if you can learn to communicate the value of what you do in a way that people understand, in a way that speaks to people's sort of pain points and aspirations, then you'll have a lot more success. And I think... um. Yeah, I th I, that's that's sort of my my conclusion is you need to make sure people care about what you're doing. Um, they don't necessarily need to understand all the nitty gritty. It, they just need to understand why it matters to them. And then you come to events like this, um, Fossil G, and that's where you get to talk about all the fun nitty gritty stuff because um, we all care about it here. And it's really great to be part of communities uh, where we have these spaces. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. Thank you so much for listening to me. I think I spoke for a little bit too long but I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks and have a great day. Thank you.